Theories we learn are called uncritical. We assume that theory applies to all, generically, at all times, to all people. But critical theory would say, no, no, no. You have to look at many things, including context, including gender, uh, including class, and many things. And you're not talking of keeping the status quo, but you're talking of bringing about social change. Okay, so when we're talking of feminism, many of them, most of them, will fall under critical theories. Okay, these are all from this book, the 501 book, carried over. Okay, and they said Marxism is the you know fountainhead from which critical theory was developed in the uh, developed capitalist Western societies, which are not undergoing armed change, but through re uh, evolutionary or through reform or through parliamentary change, but Marxist cultural introspective. Post-colonial would be people like me. Okay? I came from the Philippines. My dad came from China. Both were colonized. China, you know, the slicing of the Chinese melon. You have France, Britain, everyone else cutting a piece of China. The Philippines had Spain, okay, uh, 300 years, and the U.S. 50 years. So people will have a different view of the world. You cannot say certain theories apply universally without taking into account the colonial experience. And post-structuralism would say you cannot just say that there are only, only two types, usually binary. Okay, It's the belief that there are two major opposing systems, whatever they are. For example, capitalism versus socialism, or men versus women. Okay? But it's more complex than having two structures. That's the binary Hegelian uh, point of view. The post-structuralists, let's say, it's free for all. It's more diverse and open. And postmodernism, uh, they believe more in narratives, in different perspectives, so it's really more open. And you take sides. When you talk of critical theory, there's no such thing as neutrality. You are biased and you are clear. You can write a thesis or dissertation and say, I am clearly biased in favor of feminism. You have to make it clear. Or you can say, I am an objective, neutral observer. I'm not saying feminism is good or bad. I'm just writing about the literature. Then you're being uncritical. But feminism belongs to uh, heavily on the critical theory side. What are the things to look at? Yeah, these are from the Baumgartner, Miriam, and Caffarello book. Uh, three major things, color, class, and gender. Okay, and then you look at power and oppression. Very key. So you can look at feminism from this angle. Who has power? Who doesn't have power? Who's the oppressor and who's the oppressed? And you can do that for uh, race analysis. You can do that for class analysis too. It's power and oppression are the key variables you're looking to. Okay. Now these are the common uh, thread that uh, Miriam Caffarella and Paul Gardner saw. One, there is discrimination and it's institutionalized. Okay, it's deeply rooted. We don't even know it's there, but it's there. Okay? But people who are minorities tend to have support system to not to help one another, to cope with the institutionalized discrimination. And third, uh, whites have privilege, but most are not aware that they have uh, privilege because it's just assumed to be there. Okay, for example, I don't know. Yeah, we'll look into Obama's speech later uh, that he gave yesterday. Uh, that, uh, yeah, I think I can give you my personal example. I work at NIU. Once we had a booth, a table for the, uh, I work for Asia, the Southeast Asian Center at NIU, and we had a booth at Evanston High School. I was standing in line uh, right there. I was properly dressed with all of my cards and all of my paraphernalia, and the receptionists were teachers. And one, two, three, four, five people came in front of me. I was ignored. I was like, what is going on? Can you not see me? I'm big, right? 
and they did deal with me. And I just protested, I said, excuse me, I've been standing here. You've checked in five persons, I'm right in front of the line, you did not deal with me. I said, this is racism. And he said, oh, look, come on, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it, let's go out, uh, let's talk. Like, how can you miss me? I'm overweight. <laughs> I was right in front, and I, I'm not, you know, I have color, you can see me, you know, I have color. I'm, how can I be invisible? And she profusely apologized that I was just fuming mad. Like, how can I be invisible? Like, yeah, yeah, people of color know this. We go through this on a daily basis, not daily, on a regular basis, shall I put it. Okay, that's, so whites don't know that whites are privileged. Like, all the other whites came in, like, yeah. Uh, I, this last spring, I kind of, I was on, the, on an opposite end of something that I'm sure that the yeah. student faced all the time. Yeah. I was working with at a high school, predominantly Latino students. Yeah. Um, and it was a very young girl, about freshman or a sophomore, and she was doing her homework and she was in our program and she had, hadn't taught to me or anything like that. And at one point when she finally decided to talk to me, her, her first question was, are you white? And she was like very timid. Yeah. And I never had in my experience, no yeah. one's ever asked That's me as a white yeah. person yeah. about my race. Okay. Um, and yeah. it was just very, yeah. it was, yeah. it was, it was Could somebody explain why a student would ask that? Does anyone know experience from the students? No, two hands, yeah. Please, oh. one and two. Oh, like, oh, it's more about like really comfortable. Yeah. Um, especially at, some, at a younger age. It was very interesting that I, I wasn't consulted at all. I felt, you know, 
Yeah, like I said, I empathize with the situation more than the both of them. It arouses our curiosity. Maybe next time you'll also invite somebody to ask back, oh, you know, why did you ask? You know, and then report back to us. So, <laughs> so we will know the yeah. psychology of the child. Why, why they ask the question? Thank you. And then number four, therefore many of the programs in school and you know in nursing homes, in hospitality sector, like hot, uh, hotels. They train people how to be culturally sensitive because of people say we're being ignored. But there's a bad example from Target. Some people leak information saying, oh, you want, this is how you deal with Latinos. This is very bad. I'm warning you. It's not me. It's okay. It's okay. And they say, number one, if they're Mexican, they're less educated. And if you talk to them, they will say, yeah, even if they don't understand. So just keep that in mind. They tell their employees. And number two, uh, they say if they're Cubans, they are more, they are better educated. Like it's sweeping stereotype, sweeping. Okay, and then uh, tell them you cannot bargain in the stores. Like it's an insulting cultural sensitivity training. It's not, it's not proper way of training. You know, instead of learning about the diversity, they're stereotyping further. I don't know if you've heard this or other stereotypes. I, I used to work at a nonprofit, and my supervisor yeah. had no experience in diversity, yeah. but I did customer service. I was like a caseworker. And yeah. they, uh, they were like, well, you know, when the Mexicans come in, they usually come in like right before we close, so be prepared to stay like an extra 15 minutes. And, you know, um, it's going to take you like a half hour to talk to them, whereas like the American clients, it'll only take you 10 minutes, and you have to explain everything to them very, very, very slowly, and they don't know what Sometimes and you have to explain to them what a form is. I was like, I understand that some, maybe. I was like, but to say the majority. Well, I don't like that. <laughs> I did telemarketing, and they say, do not call any Patels because they were. Because I didn't know until I. You know, why? Because they will, they will, we're doing telemarketing and come out for a free estimate. They're like, they'll have you come out all the time for free just to look, and that was it. They would never buy. So they said they never call the tells. That's profiling. Yeah. <laughs> My concern goes all over the place. It's a tell. It's a phone name. Yeah, it's a very common name. Mm -hmm. Okay, findings. Now, so we'll look at the philosophy <coughs> ideology and then her story. Okay, this is in Portuguese, Dr. Ora can read it because he speaks Portuguese aside from Spanish, but I read the translation. And we have seen this earlier. Feminism is a radical idea that women are people. That was actually the exact quote yeah. that oh, okay. said. I, I misstated it, but that's what she said. Okay. I knew that's what you were referring to. Yeah. It's a very popular quotation. Feminism is a radical idea that women are people. So what is philosophy? And what are some issues that impinge on feminism? Who among you are undergrad philosophy major or took one class at least? All right. Yeah, one <laughs> time. Whatever you remember. Yeah. So one thing you remember. Were you a major or you took a class? No, I had to be. Jenna. Jenna, okay. That's fine. One thing you remember. I don't remember a lot. That's <laughs> okay. What are you asking? What is philosophy or what are some issues? Number one, what is philosophy? And two, what are some issues in philosophy that affect the study of women or feminism? Philosophy is the way we think. way we think, yeah. Sure, yeah, good. Some major subfields, or others too. Huh? Don't worry, there's no test on this. 